نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مدل لا ومن يدلل فلا هادي لا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا أبده ورسوله ثم أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So continuing um, the lessons of Arba'in al-Nawawi the 40 hadith that Imam al-Nawawi brings uh, which encompasses as we said all of the main things that the Muslim should be concerned about whether it be with regards to belief whether it be with regards to manners and morals etc etc the first hadith just a quick recap really a brief 5-10 minute recap of what we've done so far so obviously it's very important that if we are coming to these lessons that basically we remember what the lessons are about we benefit from them and we try to memorize them so you know whoever's able to do so he should try to memorize the hadith if you can't memorize it in Arabic at least try to memorize it in English so the first hadith was إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى إِلَىٰ آخِرِهِ So the basically the intention, that every action is but by the intention. And every man will get that which he intended. And we mention a number of key things which is, number one, that all of the actions, they must be done sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the most important thing. And we mentioned that it is one of the greatest hadith or the most important hadith in all of the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This combined with other hadith such as the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha when she said, man, or when she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad, that whoever introduces a matter in this religion which is not from us, i.e. not from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then it will be rejected. Why did we say that these two are important? And I will repeat it again because it's so important. Number one, because the hadith with regards to intention is about everything with regards to purifying your intention and doing something solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha basically shows all the outward side of a person's actions. They must be in accordance with what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. And no action is accepted in Islam without these two things coming together. The other main things that we mentioned about the first hadith was that it distinguishes between tamiz wal ibadat min al adat wa tamiz wal ibadat ba'duha min ba'd. That basically, that the intention distinguishes between actions of habit and actions of ibadah. For example, we gave just quickly, like for example, a person could have a bath just because he's feeling hot. This means he will not get no reward for it. But if a person has a bath because he's in a state of janaba, he will do the same action, but it's not a habitual action, it's an action of ibadah now. So the intention distinguishes between actions which are habitual and actions which are worship. And also it distinguishes between one action of worship and another action of worship. So if for example a person could pray two rak'ah, the two rak'ah could be sunnah, of Fajr or it could be the Fard of Fajr and it is all distinguished between by the intention finally on the first hadith we said something that the Salaf they used to be very concerned about the intention and they said that actually one action can contain numerous intentions and it is the one of the hardest things to control why and we gave one example and we will repeat it for example a person is coming and he's praying the Fard prayer and he intends solely the sake of, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then somebody else enters the masjid and he realizes somebody else has entered from behind him and he starts to maybe beautify his prayer more or he starts to concentrate more. And now his intention has become to do the action because he's trying to please the people. So again, the person must quickly refresh the intention and make it solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we may moved on to the second hadith. And we mentioned the second hadith is the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam 
when he came to the companions and he came to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he came and sat with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companions they said that we didn't recognize this person he was wearing the whitest of clothes and he had the blackest of hair and none of us knew him and there were no signs of travel on him and he comes and sits with the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he asks him akhbirni anil islam asked him tell me about islam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said an tash'ada an la ilaha illa allah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah wa تقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة وتسوم رمضان وتحج البيت إن استطعت إليه سبيلا. That basically you should the Islam is the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said to believe that none should be worshipped but Allah سبحانه وتعالى and Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is his slave and his messenger. And secondly, you should perform the prayers and you should give in charity and you should fast in Ramadan and you should perform Hajj. Whosoever is able to do so. And we went through all five of these pillars. And we went through again, the important thing that I want to mention was with regards to the shahada, we said it also indicates the same thing that we mentioned about the first hadith, which is it comprises of two main things, the shahada. And the reason the scholars say that the shahada came as one statement and isn't considered to be two separate pillars is because it combines that one, the person should do something solely for Allah. When we say, Tashhada an la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the slave and messenger of Allah. Meaning, we do the actions solely as the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us to do them, and no action again, as we said, will be accepted without both of these things coming together. So we moved on. Then the then the this man that came. He then asks the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Akhbirni anil iman." He asks the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Tell me about iman." And the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "An tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulih wa liyom al akhiri wa tu'mina bil qadri khairihi wa sharri." That basically that it is to believe in Allah and the angels and the books and the messengers and to believe in the last day. And to believe in Al Qadr, the good of it and the bad thereof. So we discussed, as I said, the first part, and we moved on, and we said, and we will, and I'm going to repeat some of the main things from the first part. We said that belief in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala necessitates four things. Very important. Number one, we said it means necessitates. The belief in the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the Sheikh says, and just to remind the people, we are going through. Basically, I'm trying to translate as much as possible of a works done by Sheikh Salih Al Uthaymin, one of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah Wal Jamaa of our time, who has now passed away. May Allah bless him and give him from the highest ranks of paradise. So he mentions that number one is to believe in uh, is to believe in the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and he says. Whoever rejects the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is not a believer, and none can really disbelieve. And then he says something interesting. He says no one can really disbelieve in the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Even those mushrikeen and those people that say we are atheist or they say that we don't believe in Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is trying to indicate in the ayat that in reality all of these people actually really know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala exists. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentions with regards to Musa alayhi salam when he said to Fir'aun, "لَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ مَا أَنْزَلَ هَؤُلَاءِ إِلَّا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بَصَائِرَ." That basically, O oh, O oh, O oh, Fir'aun, the reality is that you really know that only Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. So no matter how much he tried to. يَجْحَدُ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى The match, as much as he tried to fight the signs of Allah سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى Allah سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى is trying to indicate that in reality he knew. And likewise the disbelievers, most of them, when you talk to them, even most of the people that I have talked to, and I generally even at work try to talk to as many people as possible about Islam. I'm not shy to talk to anyone about anything. And you generally find even when they say they're atheist, very quickly it becomes, oh no, I'm agnostic, meaning I don't really know. Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God. And then when you go to them in detail, very quickly it's easy to convince them that there is a God. 
only very few people are very staunch in terms of their atheism. And even then, it's just something maybe they've been reading a lot, they've been really down that path, the people they hang around with, they're convinced of that. And they've never really spoken to somebody who is really convincing from a monotheistic perspective. Number two, he says, believing in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believing in the rububiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the organizer. He is the master. He is the one that created the heavens and the earth. And another great example here of what we said before is, when the, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to talk to the Quraysh, they used to know about these things. It wasn't the case that they were mushriks because they didn't know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created everything. It wasn't because they knew. So when Allah talks in Surah Al-Mu'minun and says, when you ask them who is the one that created the heavens and the earth, they will say it is Allah. Then when you ask them who is the one that brings rain down from the sky and makes the plants grow, they will say it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that it is said about them, then why do you disbelieve? Meaning all of these things, unless you come with all four of these things that we mention, you will not be considered to be a believer. So number one is, we believe in the existence of Allah. Number two, we believe in the rububiyya of Allah. And I will say both of these, the mushrikeen at the time of the Prophet wasallam, they believed in both of them. Number three, believing in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Belief in the uluhiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believing that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of worship. And the Shaykh doesn't say, but I will say that most of the Muslims today, maybe not most, but I will say a lot of the Muslims today, the reality is they are committing shirk of some form or another. Maybe they are unaware of it. Some of them may be in their extreme views. They are even aware of what they are doing, but they will label shirk with something else. So we find from us, for example, me, I, my, my family, they are from the Asian subcontinent. And we find that generally people of the Asian subcontinent, and I've generally found now having worked with a lot of Indians as well that are Hindus or Sikhs, you generally find that the Islam of the people of Pakistan or India is very much mixed with the beliefs of Hinduism. Because they all live together, you generally find that the things that some of them do, you find that the Hindus do it as well. So you find a common thing, for example, the Hindus, they will say that we have many gods, but actually we believe in one God. We only use these gods to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you say in the same way you find the people in the Asian subcontinent, they will say that we only go to the graves because we believe that these people in the graves, we cannot get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except through them because they were better than us. So the reality is that the true believer is the one that he realizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close and that he has a relationship directly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever he needs is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is able to go directly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have like the Christians have that you want to go to the box and you want to tell the priest about your sins and then basically maybe you will be forgiven. It's not like this, ya ikhwan. The reality in Islam is that you've done a sin and you will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And something interesting that Shaykh Salih al fawzan he mentions, which I found very interesting in his explanation, was you find that these people from the Muslims, that they say that basically that we need a wasila with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we need somebody who we can go through for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They give the example of look at a king. A king cannot deal with everybody at the same time. He's at too high a position. And their argument would be that he needs people, for example, ministers, people, delegates, that they will come and deal with the people for him. But they, and they say they try to make this comparison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Shaykh says this is ridiculous. In fact, they are basically ridiculing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are debasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do they not realize that in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can deal with, as Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close. If you are to ask from him, he will give to you. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if every Muslim 
or even non-Muslims were to ask guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same second, at the same time, in the same place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be able to respond to every single one of them. As I said many times in one of the khutbahs, I said, it's not like a doctor. You go to the doctor and the doctor has too many patients. He says, I'm not going to be able to deal with some of them today. Bring them and give them an appointment another time. It's not like this, ya ikhwan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can deal with all of you at the same time. He can respond to all of you at the same time. So worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And lastly, he mentions the tawheed in the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Shaykh Uthaymeen, he says, actually, most of the innovators in Islam, they are because they do not truly realize how to deal with the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That either we said they make one of four mistakes. They make the harif, meaning they change the meaning of the verses, or they change the meaning of the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa because it doesn't sit with them well. And he gives some examples. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. And because they do, and I remember when I was at university, and the people, they used to say to me, that some of the people of the deviant groups, they used to come and they sit with people. And they are very active sometimes. They come and sit with you and they say, how can you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arose over the throne? Because this would necessitate in their view, because they use the intellect before they come to the text. If something doesn't sit right with their intellect, they will go with their intellect and they will change the verses and the ayat and the hadith. So he said, for example, if you're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rose, that means Allah is restricted to time and space. Meaning he was in one place, then he rose and he was in another place. So it's a confusion for them. But as Imam Malik, he says that, you know, we will come to it, that this is silly. These are silly types of questions. And the most important thing I learned from Shaykh Uthaymeen in this sharh is, don't ask such questions. The one that delves into the details of these questions is the one that will go astray. Rather stick to the basics, which is, قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا That we hear and we obey. We, whatever the texts say, we go with what is apparent in the text. But لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ but for sure we know that there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that we mentioned something, again the Shaykh doesn't mention, but most of the scholars they mentioned. In this ayah, the deviant groups always only mention one part of the ayah, which is, Laytha kemithlihi shaykh. There is nothing like unto him. But Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they mentioned the last bit. Laytha kemithlihi shayun wa huwa sami ul basir. That there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is the all-hearing and the all-seeing. Meaning all of these deviant groups, if they have a problem when they say with rising, then they should have a problem with Allah saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees. Or they should have a problem with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that He hears. Because we hear and we see. But we know that Allah, the hearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. And we don't, we don't go into the details of how He hears or etc. We know it is perfect. And we know that is nothing like our hearing. And we know his seeing is perfect and is nothing like our seeing. And likewise, we know that Allah rose over the arsh. And, but we don't know how. And we don't ask. It's not important. And we don't make ta'atil, which means to deny totally whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And we don't make taqif. We don't ever ask how. How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create Adam with his hands? How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arise over the throne? These are questions we don't ask them. And we don't delve into them. And we don't make tamthil. And we know that nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the creation. And if we remember these four things, and we stick to the text, and we never do these four things, we will always be on the path of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And briefly he mentioned with regards to the verse again, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa. He said many of the defiant groups, they said it doesn't mean istawa, it means istawla. Meaning to conquer or to overpower. Meaning it doesn't mean Allah arose, it means Allah conquered the throne or he overpowered the throne because it doesn't sit with them right. 
But as Imam Malik radiyallahu anhu ta'ala he says that basically al istawa ghayru majhulin meaning this istawa in the Arabic language is meaning of the word istawa is well known amongst the Arabs it's not something that is strange to us or we are ignorant of it means ala wartafa meaning it means to go above and to rise however the rising is specific befitting the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing like the general rising of the created things. So the one who gives tasir of istawa as istawla, he says, has not realized true iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lima khalaqtu The one who I created with my own two hands that you find from the deviant groups that they will say it doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam or created with his own hands. It means that he created with his power, bi or bi with his strength or with his ability. But no, we say if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has hands, then we affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hands. But for sure they are not like our hands and we will not go into any of the four matters that we talked about. How? Why? etc etc we will not deny it we will not change it we will just accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said for himself and then he goes on to the thing that we know that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala he fought for a long time and he was put in prison for and this was fighting the fact that the disbelievers in or the deviant groups in his time they were persecuting him and imprisoning him because he said that the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find from the deviant groups, they will say, no, it is not the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, because they have the same problem. How can we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks? Because this is an attribute of the creation. Uncreated, yes. Yes, so they say that this thing, these words which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, they are something which is created. And they are something which... Jibreel alayhi salam, he heard these created words and then he passed them down to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But no, these words are not something created. These are, this is the literally the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, we just find, and to keep it simple at the end of all this, the reason that the scholars bring these details in these matters is because the Muslims have fallen into these mistakes. So maybe you will sit with somebody and they will mention these types of things. But the reality is for you as Muslims, you keep it simple. Which is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions something for himself, you accept it. And if the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions something, you accept it. And you don't fall into these deviant mistakes. And again he says, anyone that falls into these things, they do not realize true iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Shaykh, he says, we do not say that they are not believers. Rather, they are believers without doubt. However, they do not realize true Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are mistaken and they are in opposition to the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And they are false, wrong, misguided without doubt. However, we do not rule one who holds these views with misguidance until the evidences are established upon him. And then he also says, even if the hujja is established on him and he continues on this mistake and misguidance, then he is an innovator in regards to whatever he has rejected. However, he says he can still be Salafi in what he is correct. And to clarify this point, he's saying this with regards to names and attributes. We can't apply the same principle everywhere. For example, if a person says, I will go and worship the grave and he doesn't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, even in the single firm and he worships the graves, we will not say it's okay for him to do that, but he's okay with Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and everything else. No, this is something that will take him away from Islam totally. He will not be even regarded as a Muslim if he falls into something which is clear shirk. But in regards to these details of names and attributes, the Shaykh is saying, we will say he is innovated with regards to what he is wrong in. Just to clarify that. So he says specifically, rather he is Salafi in that which he agrees with the Salaf with regards to the names and attributes. And he is an innovator in that which he opposes them.
he goes into another detailed discussion I will just go briefly which is he says that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentions in a hadith anna Allah khalaqa adam ala suratihi that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam in his own image and they say if we take it in the apparent form how do we understand this how can we say that basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam in his own image what does it mean and they, the scholars, the Shaykh Taymin, he tries to explain that when you even, if, as long as you don't make tamthil and all the rest of the things, it doesn't mean he made him in his own image. So it means everything about that person or Adam is just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't necessitate that. And he brings another hadith which may clarifies this where he says, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna awwala zumratin tudkhalu al-jannatu ala surat al-qamar, laylat al-badri, that when the people they will enter Jannah, that the first of them they will enter like the image, like, like, that of the, like that of the moon, that they will be glowing. It doesn't mean in reality, because they are radiant and they are glowing, it doesn't mean that they basically are literally like now the moon. But they have a certain thing which is, you know, like, for example, in his image. It doesn't mean in totality now we can say, that basically because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him in his own image, that it means now that we need to say that this necessitates, that we are saying that he is exactly like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, we don't mean this at all. Let's not fall into any of these mistakes. But rather we say whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and rather we say whatever the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. And we keep it like that. And we will mention Imam Malik, that one man, he came inside the masjid. And he asks Imam Malik, and this is very interesting. And I was very interested by what the Shaykh said. He said the man came in and he says, well, because, the, because Imam Malik is saying, Ar-Rahman wa ala al-arsh istawa. So the man says, Kayfa istawa? How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rise? And Imam Malik responded to him with a famous saying. He says, Al-istawa'u ghayru majhulin. That basically istawa is not unknown. Meaning, like I said before, Shaykh Uthaymi says, the meaning of istawa is well known with the Arabs, what it means. And he says, well, kayfu ghayru ma'qulin. And how is something that we cannot understand. It is incomprehensible. We don't go into that. Well, imanu bihi wajibun. And to believe in it is obligatory. Wasu'alu anhu bid'atun. And to ask more questions about it is innovation. Ma, and then he says to this man, Ma araka illa mubtadi'a, that I don't see you except that you are an innovator. And then he asks for this man to be taken outside of the masjid, to be kicked out of the masjid. And Shaykh Uthaymin, he says, some people they said this was extreme, like how can he kick him outside of the masjid? And Shaykh Uthaymin, he says, how about the one who comes to the masjid and he has garlic or onions? That he is told that he shouldn't come to the masjid. Yet how about one who he doesn't affirm true belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is more deserving to be kicked out of the masjid than the one who just comes having eaten garlic or onions. So the shaykh says, so if one who eats garlic and onions is not allowed to enter the masjid, then how about one who enters such questions which ruins people's religions? And then he says, أُحَذِّرُكُمْ أَن تَتَعَمَّقُوا فِي بَابِ الْأَسْمَاءِ وَالصِّفَاتِ وَأَن تَسْأَلُوا عَمَّا لَا حَاجَةَ لَكُمْ بِهِ The Shaykh, he says, that I warn you into going into deeply into these issues. And that you ask about those things which don't benefit you or that you have no need to ask about them. And he goes into some other discussions as well. For example, Inna quluba bani adama bayna asbu aini min asabi ar-Rahman That indeed the, the, the hearts of Bani Adam, they are between the two fingers of the fingers of ar-Rahman. 
And the shaykh, uh, shaykh he goes into some details that sometimes what people will do, they will even say by point with their fingers, like saying that basically like the two fingers here, you don't do any of that because this is like comparison. We never do anything like this. We don't know what the fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are like, how they are. We don't ask any questions. But we know that they exist because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned them. Is it clear? Is anybody confused about this? To keep it simple, if Allah has mentioned something about Himself, we affirm it, we accept it. We don't ask how, we don't deny it, we don't change the meaning. And we don't make comparison with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ever. And as he says, don't go into the details, just accept. We move on, the next thing. وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ And to believe in the angels. And the Shaykh, he says, that why the angels before Qutb wa Rusul? Why is in the Hadith, the belief in the angels mentioned before the books and the messengers. Because he says that basically the angels are from the unseen. Whereas the prophets, they are from the human beings. We can see human beings. And we recognize human beings. And we recognize books. But we don't know. The hard thing, a harder thing to believe in is the angels because we don't see them. Unless Allah gives us the permission to see them, he says. Obviously like this hadith, where Angel Jibreel alayhi salam is coming in the form of a human being. And he says the angels are made of light. They do not need to eat and drink. The Shaykh says the angels, they have no need to eat and drink. Kama ja'a fi sahihi Muslim. And they have different roles and responsibilities. They don't all have the same role and responsibility. And they are all worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't foil and have choice. They do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to do. And he says the belief in the angels consists of the following things. Number one, believing in the belief in the names of the angels which have been mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. For example, Jibreel alayhi salam has been mentioned by name. So we believe in those angels which have been mentioned by name. And we believe in the angels and their specific duties and roles. For example, Jibreel alayhi salam is responsible for wahi, for the revelation, and taking the revelation and giving it to the prophets, to the messengers. And Mikail alayhi salam, who is responsible for rain and the plants. And, and Israfil alayhi salam, who is responsible for blowing the trumpet. And something beautiful that the Shaykh mentions here. He says when the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to stand in the night prayer. He used to always start by saying, Allahumma Rabbi Jibra'il wa Mikail wa Israfil. O the, o the Lord of Jibra'il, O Mikail and Israfil. Why? He says because these three angels, they control everything to do with life. What do we mean? Jibreel alayhi salam, that no one can have success and no one in true reality can have any form of life until he accepts the true faith and the true religion. And these, Jibreel alayhi salam was responsible for bringing these true religions by giving them to the messenger. So he gives life to the human beings in this life. And Mikail alayhi salam, likewise is responsible for giving life. Meaning everything in terms of the rain, everything and life comes from the rain and comes from the plants. Without these things that no one can have life. So again this angel is responsible for life. And Israfil, the one who blows the trumpet, he is responsible for the one and the ultimate life, which will be the life of the hereafter. Meaning, will he be from the people of hellfire or will he be from the people of Jannah? And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَيَعْلُمُ مَا جَرَحْتُمْ بِالنَّهَارِ ثُمَّ 
ثُمَّ يَبَعَثُكُمْ فِي And he is the one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has taken your souls in the night. And he knows what you have worked during the day. And then he will raise you again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah يَتَوَفَّ الْأَنفُسَ حِينَ مَوْتِهَا وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُتْ فِي مَنَامِهَا فَيُمْشِكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ وَيُرْسِلَ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that he will take away the souls. He will bring death to the souls. And he will bring death to the soul. That basically while it is sleeping. So there's two circumstances. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take your soul totally. It will be your final death. Or he will take your soul meaning just while you are sleeping. فَيُمْسِكَ الَّذِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ and he will take and he will hold on to and he will grab whoever death is written for him. وَيُرْسِلَ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى And the rest of them, he will give them life again. Meaning another day that after you wake up in the night and you had died, Allah has given you life again. That's why he says, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned these angels. Because again after day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taken his soul, when he was waken, awoken, he was given life again. So Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was mentioning these angels who are responsible because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them that responsibility of bringing these forms of life. And the Shaykh doesn't then mention, but I took from elsewhere some of the other main angels from the fatawa of the ulama. And we have the angel called Malik, who is the keeper of the hellfire. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَادُوا يَا مَالِكُوا لِيَقْدِيَ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكُ قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ And they will call to, the ma to Malik. Malik here is an angel who is basically the keeper of hellfire. And they will say, Oh Malik, tell your Lord to call us to account now. We cannot bear it anymore. And the angel will say to them, إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ Verily you will abide here. This is your place. Indeed, you are residents here. Meaning in the hellfire. Secondly, munkar wa nakir. That they will be the ones that will come to the person in the grave. And they will, and, the, and I took a long hadith which is very beautiful. And we will mention it. The Abu Huraira radiallahu an. He said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when the deceased is buried, two black angels will come to him. One is Munkar and the other is Nakir. And they will ask this man, what did you say about this man? Meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did you say about this man? And this man, he will respond and he says that he used to say, إِنَّهُ أَبْدٌ وَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ That he is the slave and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi He is the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. And they, the angels, they will both say, We know, we knew beforehand that you used to believe this and you used to say this. Then his grave will widen. And it will become very wide and very long. The, the distance between which is 70 by 70 cubits as mentioned in the hadith, and the grave will become illuminated for him. It will become very nice, and very radiant, and very illuminated. Then they will say, sleep, rest, sleep. And the man will say, please go back to my family and tell them. And they, they the angels will say, sleep like a bridegroom, who no one will wake up except the most beloved one. Meaning Allah is the only one now who will wake you when the day of judgment will come. Meaning until Allah raises him up. And if the deceased was a hypocrite, he will say, I heard the people say such and such. So I said such and such. I do not know, he will say. They say, we knew beforehand that you used to say this. Meaning we knew before you even said that this is what you are going to say. They say, the earth will then be told to squeeze him and he will be crushed 
until his ribs are interlocked. And he will remain like that until Allah raises him up. Kama jaa fi tirmizi. And he mentions then also, or oh sorry, the Shaykh doesn't mention, we mentioned additionally from other books, Harut and Marut. The angels Harut and Marut who came with the knowledge of magic and to teach the people about magic. But they warned the people that don't learn this magic from us. It wasn't a case of they were coming to teach the magic and they were saying to the people, take it from us and learn it from us. They were well warning the people, don't learn this from us. Really, this is a fitna for you. Then he says there are some angels. Secondly, so some of the angels, they are mentioned by name. And we mentioned those angels which are mentioned by name. Then there are those angels which are not mentioned by name. But their responsibilities are mentioned. For example, the angels which record the good and the bad deeds. They are with you all the time. Kalla bal din katibin. Nay, they belie the day. You belie the day of the judgment when everybody will stand. Wa inna alaykum They are over you guardians. Kiraman katibin, noble, and they write down everything that you are doing. And the Shaykh then goes back and he says, Shaykh Uthaymeen, the angels who travel the earth and they sit in the circles of knowledge. So they are angels from the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They just basically travel the earth. Fasiru fil ard. And they sit in circles like these. And they come and sit and they sit with us here. Because they want to listen to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is mentioned about the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the knowledge of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are beautiful times that with us are the angels and we are with those angels that only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. And he says, and they are those that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. They do nothing but worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُسَبِّحُونَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ لَا يَفْتَرُونَ They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. And they do not tire from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are those angels that they welcome the people of paradise. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. And the angels, they enter from every door. They enter upon them, meaning the people of paradise, from every door, saying salam to you because of what you were patient with. Meaning you waited for this time, you were patient in the dunya, you waited for this opportunity, and now from every door, angels are going to enter you, O people of paradise. And they are going to say to you, Salamun alaykum, peace be unto you. Subhanallah. Um, and then the Shaykh says about the books. He says, Wa kutubihi, and the belief in the books. And he says, the, the belief in the books necessitates. Belief in all of the books sent to the messengers in their original form. And this is important for the children, especially when you're talking to your children. Because we say we believe in all the books. But what does it mean? What is our real belief with regards to the Injil? And with regards to the Torah? And with regards to the Zabur? And with regards to the Suhaf Ibrahim? And with regards to the Suhaf Musa? What is our belief with regards to these previous books? Yes, we believe in all of these books, but we believe as they were, as they were given in their original form to the prophets at that time, that what they were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel alayhi salam, that that was truth. 
And that was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is with those books now is not was what was given to the messengers at that time. So we do not believe in the Bible that the Christians hold now. We believe in the Injil. And don't think that the Bible and the Injil, they are the same thing. No. The Bible is what they have now. But the Injil is what was given to Isa alayhi salam. And the Torah is what was given to Musa alayhi salam. And it's not the Old Testament that they have now. So be very clear about this. That the only book that we believe in now is the Quran. Which is the unchanged kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, he says, belief. And this is interesting what he says, belief in whatever is authentic in them, in whatever has not been changed. So yes, if there is something in those books which conforms to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then we can assume that this is something that was not changed in those books. And we can accept that because the criterion is, the Burhan is the Qur'an. The criteria for judging what is right and wrong in those previous books of what remains of them now is the Qur'an. To believe as he says, and he says there's an ikhtilaf in this matter. He actually says to believe in the rules of what came in the previous books, so long as they did not contradict the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So if there's something in them, he said that the scholar, Shaykh Uthaymin, he says they differed with regards to if there were some rules and regulations in the previous books, which we can say that don't contradict the book and the sunnah, then is it okay for us to follow those rules and regulations? And he said some scholars went one way and some the other way. Wallahu a'lam. So we say generally, but the key thing here is that we follow the Qur'an and the sunnah. And the Qur'an is the criteria of what it remains of correctness in those previous books. And for us, the criteria is the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says to believe in the names of what is known from the books, i.e. the Qur'an, the Torah, the Injil, the Zabur, the Suhuf of Ibrahim, and the Suhuf of Musa. And then he says, belief in the Prophet, wa rusulihi. He says, believing in all of the prophets. And we know this from the Qur'an. Again and again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Qur'an that we believe in the prophets. All of them. وَلَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ And we don't differentiate between one of the prophets and another prophet. We as Muslims, we believe in all of the prophets that were sent. And this is an important point when starting discussions with the Christians. That whenever I tend to talk to them, I said to, it's, it's important for the Christians especially that you establish with them as Muslims. We love Isa alayhi salam. And from the principles of our religion is that no Muslim can be a Muslim. And we don't basically choose one prophet. Say we believe in Isa and we don't believe in Musa. We believe in Musa and we don't believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And we believe in Muhammad but we don't believe in Ibrahim alayhi salam. No. We as the believers and the true believers, we believe in all of the prophets and the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. And the reality was that the Jews, they should have become Christians when Isa alayhi salam came. And you Christians, you should have become Muslims when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. And he mentions that, an nabi the difference between an nabi and an rasul And he says that an nabi are basically the prophets. And Adam alayhi salam was the first Nabi. And then the prophets, the first prophet, Rasul, sorry, the first messenger, Rasul was Nuh alayhi salam. And the final messenger was the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And what is the difference between them? That the Nabi, he comes with a message, he comes with something, but he is not told. He doesn't come with a specific revelation and he's told to, to give this message to all of the people. So we find that Adam and the prophet, many prophets came after him, but they didn't come with a new message. And even the Shaykh says, what if someone asks, what is the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending many, many prophets again and again if they didn't come with anything new? So the, the Shaykh, he says that sometimes the people, they need to be reminded. 
that maybe even they go and they forget about what was come or they basically for the people that want to be guided Allah sends them more and more prophets to remind them of what message was come before not to bring them something new uh, but the Rasul he comes with something new and he's told to convey this new message which has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the creation as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna anzalna tawrata fiha hudan wa nurun يحكم بها النبيون الذين أسلموا للذين هادوا. So for Allah subhanahu wa taala says, indeed we send the Torah, in it is guidance and a light. يحكم بها النبيون. The prophets that came, meaning many prophets came after the Torah, and they kept saying that to the people, follow this Torah. They didn't come with a new message. They were saying, follow. يحكم بها النبيون الذين أسلموا. Basically, they were saying, follow this, لِلَّذِينَ هَادُوا Telling the people who were guided that carry on, believe and accept this Torah which was come. They weren't coming with a new message. And then the Shaykh, he says, that the messengers, they are a degree above the prophets. Because they are given a specific responsibility of bringing something new. And from the messengers are those that are the highest of the messengers. They are the Ulul Azm. They are the five prophets. Basically, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says about them, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِن نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى And when we took the covenant from the, prof- from the prophets, وَمِنْكَ Meaning from you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمِن نُوح And from Nuh alayhi salam Wa Ibrahim and from Ibrahim, Wa Musa and from Musa and from Isa, Wa Isa. These five prophets, they were the Ulul Azm. They were the best of the messengers, sorry. They were the best of the messengers. And then the best of all of the messengers and the best of all of the prophets was the prophet and messenger Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about himself, that I am khayru bani Adam. That I am the best of the people of Adam. That I am the best of the creation. And as we know from us, from the night journey, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he led all of the Prophets in prayer. So he was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the best of all the prophets. Can you actually imagine that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is leading all of the prophets and from them who is from of the followers and following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Ibrahim Alaihi Salam. When Ibrahim Alaihi Salam, Allah says about him that he is the Khalil of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He is the one beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He is so loved. You know that in the Arabic language, they say there are nine levels of mahabba. There are nine levels of love. And Khalil is the highest form of love that some, one person can have for another. Or that your Lord can have for somebody. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ibrahim, he is my Khalil. That he is the most beloved one to me. All the difficulties that he went through from being asking. And even the Shaykh Khamal mentions, can you imagine that Ibrahim, he didn't have any children for a long time. And he's coming to an old age. And now he's been given a son, Ismail alayhi salam. You know, meaning he's not having a son early. So he's thinking that even if I you know, kill my son, I slaughter my son, I've got a long life left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless me with more children. No, he's coming to an old age. And, and, and then not only the shaykh says, not only is Ismail, he's not a little baby anymore. Maybe you lose your child, you don't have many, many memories of him. And he says, neither is he too young, and neither is Ismail too old. Meaning when the children, they become old, they forget about their parents. Maybe they go away, they get married, they don't come to their parents anymore. But rather he was at an age when he's so loved by the parents, and he loves his father so much, that everywhere that Ibrahim salam is going, he wants to take Ismail salam with him. At that time he was tested. And he was told that you need to slaughter your son. And even Ismail, he says to his father that do what Allah has commanded you.
And then after that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the best of all of the Prophets and all of the Messengers. This should explain to you how much Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he loves the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how great the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is why, and the Shaykh doesn't mention, but it comes, كَمَا جَاءَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ that لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. Then the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "O oh you, meaning Muslims, none of you will really truly believe in Allah until you love me. حتى أكون أحب إليه until I become more beloved to you than your father, than your son." than your father, than the whole of the creation. So we will inshallah end there and we will carry on inshallah next time from the belief in the next day, last day and the belief in Qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar We'll end there. I don't take questions. <laughs> you got questions, you can ask uh, Rafi, inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum.